let me introduce Keith Johnson to you. You know, thank you, Tim. Uh, I'm glad to be on board. And I, I think you kind of know what I'm going to be talking about. But basically, uh, we, we all know now computer power has gotten pretty good. And uh, we're able to craft great recordings uh, using workstations. And we're able to document them with increasing accuracy uh, to practical media. These days, the media is now interchangeable from one workstation to another, come sometimes called broadcast wave. And uh, these files can be played on, on a computer, uh, uh, complete with track lists and all of that type of thing. They can be downloaded. They're fairly robust. And this has spawned and opening up a new industry uh, where basically uh, we're dealing with interchangeable master files that can be downloaded. And the computers and, st and servers and standalone machines can play them. And we have, it gives us ergonomic access to precision capture. That is, we work very hard to make these files. They are uh, uh, extremely much work. In fact, on the conversion, on the setups, and there it is, as good as it's going to be. And, uh, so we, and in the case of the high resolution format, which is most important, there's nothing taken, there's nothing added, nothing taken, nor memorialized, nor defocused, or time warped. Basically, uh, it's about as close to analog as one could get. And the, uh, the beauty of the higher sampling rates, is you can throw out all of these complex filters and upsampling and, and and uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, 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 anyway, a lot of filters, a lot of work that people do on, on, on upsampling, downsampling, whatever, is unnecessary. Uh, these things work effortlessly. The amount of DSP power to play them back is much less. That makes life easier all the way. So this is, a, in, a, in a way, on the playback, a very robust media. And it works pretty nicely, even on a, just computer speakers or something like that. You can sometimes tell the difference. Um, so the, in, in having something like that, we're avoiding what, what, we, what I would call technological intrusion. That is, uh, music is music. Uh, the experience that I'm trying to create, like visual acoustics, which is that of closing the eyes and it happens, you start building up an image of, of the whole thing that's around you. Uh, if you hear a speaker, you hear something funny or something distracting, that, that character goes away. So if I, for example, let's see if I can have the lights down a little bit some way. Uh, visual acoustics, here we go. Uh, boom. Fast. There's a reason for, for me doing this. These are great spaces. They, they present a, an image of, of a concert, because I record concerts, therefore, or, or, or classical music, so this is my style. It could have been a grubby stage on, in, a, in a, uh, a venue, like a street you know, a club or something like that, the kind of thing where you can scrape the nostalgia off with your fingernails. And a recording should be able to capture that. And that's perfectly fine. It doesn't have to be concert hall at that point. That's not the object. You're there. And so here, in this case, uh, we're there in this. Uh, in crafting a recording, one of the things that's most important is that in listening to a concert, we not only have the instruments in front of us and the people playing them, but we tend to look at whoever and whatever is going on. It means we turn our head a little bit, we focus our hearing on what we see, and that input to our brain is not the same thing as a pair of microphones, just static. So the, the, what was originally thought of as the optimum minimal miking, just two microphones up there, does not capture what we hear. And so uh, uh, once we get these little tiny cues, then we can relax back. We're back to natural uh, uh, transient responses, time responses, and so forth. We can hear delineation, transparency, placement. 
And at that point, the brain doesn't process very much. So we can relax. And that's the, that's the point of high resolution uh, and, and that kind of thing. Now, uh, here is our visual acoustic. And the important part of this little graph is that, as you can see, if, if uh, we get uh, a little improvement in audio quality and a little improvement in this, in this uh, visual acoustic image, we get a large improvement in the, in the whole feeling of what's going on. So this is why uh, working very hard to, to do little fine details pays off because, man, this thing starts climbing up fast as you, as you, get, to the, as you get to doing it right. Now, why do I say history of perfection? Because we're talking about something that's very good right now, but 10 years from now, somebody's gonna say, hey, you weren't there, There's, things are better now. So, uh, perfection is interesting. If you don't know what you're not supposed to know, it works beautifully. <laughs> There's an example. Uh, okay, it was perfect. There were, there were articles about this thing. It was perfect, it was a talking machine. That voice was real, it wasn't an imposter. So that was good, okay. Here we have uh, the next step up. We have, now we can hear what's going on somewhere else and it's live. We're closer to the visual acoustic because they're, well, somebody's broadcasting in New York, we're hearing them in LA or whatever, and there's things going on. There's some high frequencies, there's some low frequencies, but therefore the, the old horn was basically the symbols would have been two loaves of bread slammed together. Now there's a little more of something happening. Uh, go to the next step. And this is a system from probably the 1970s, the Infinity uh, IRS, as it was called, in, uh, Infinity Reference Standard, or whatever it was, roughly 2,000 watts of amplifier power on the woofers, and uh, uh, ribbon drivers top to bottom on sand-filled columns. To the right, you'll find a collection of master tapes, copies of master tapes, LPs. It says something. What is that about? We're talking about, I was talking about computer files, but this, other things are also what would be called top of the food chain. Uh, an L, a direct recorded LP is a beautiful thing. Uh, LP can capture information down to micro inches, fractions of a micro inch. And when you translate that to the dynamics of, of an event, it's about 120 dB or better. It's way up there. Um, the master tapes are, of course, what people created. Same thing. Uh, the, the tape has its, its properties. Both things, the LP and the tape, have limitations. But when you're playing the, the very thing that is making a major production, this is a very great experience. So there we are. Now, we go a little further in all of this. And we might say, just uh, how good is this sound? You know, what's going on? Uh, <coughs> and to do that, we have to look at a little bit of our hearing. And I think this is worthwhile. I'm going to diverge completely. We're going to go off on a tangent. And, oh, I forgot about that. We have, uh, we have uh, five channel. Five channel is beautiful in the sense that uh, there's less mental processing. It's capable of creating exactly the same, or very close to the same wide stage if the recording's made right, but the brain doesn't have to work so hard. It's even more um, things. So this is in the future, as, uh, but it's, 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 it will happen because it's downloadable and accessible. But this is the whole deal, our hearing. And it's simple enough, it, it, at least it appears to be very simple. We have a, an eardrum in the middle, and a uh, uh, thing that looks like a snail shell, and it's a cochlear thing, sometimes called a hearing nerve. And inside are a whole bunch of little hair cells. And if we look at a cross-section of the hair cells, we find something interesting about them. Uh, you'll notice there are four hair cells on top, and there's one little lonely guy off to the side, and there's a tangle of nerves going over to it. Turns out that that guy on the right is a steering mechanism. It connects with the brain. It changes the tuning of the, of the main hair cells, the main uh, four in the row. And uh, the brain 
uh, working on this uh, will now allow you to focus and, and, and focus in on something and hear it better. Uh, so uh, it's a form of feedback. And uh, it's a very delicate thing. It's unfortunate that many kids expose themselves to loud sounds. This feedback mechanism is one of the first things to go. And then what happens, it's very sad, uh, in a crowded room, they can't tell what somebody is saying on the other side. They still hear the sounds, they still hear the frequencies. They've attenuated a little bit, but the damage is, is worse than that. At that point, because complex sounds are, are, are difficult, uh, they would prefer something close, and so the, the trend is to have things that sound like inside the instrument and extremely simple harmonies, because that's what happens when, when this problem occurs. So protect the ears, basically. It's a little message here. Uh, looking at it closer, here is the electron micro uh, photo of what I was talking about. Those are the cells. There's 15,000 of them in that little grouping. Uh, and there, and Close up, they look like that. This one's not a, a human hair cell. It's a little bulbous thing off to the side. That's a chemicillium. It's, uh, you find that in amphibians, but people take amphibians apart to look at the hearing mechanism because people, it's not such a good idea to do that. <laughs> so, so anyway, it's like, uh, uh, so we have something like that. So, so how much do we hear? Well, we, we, we do pretty good at it. Uh, we, can, we can discern the a change in distance of two objects in front of us by maybe a half an inch or so. Uh, we certainly have a wide dynamic range. There's a lot going on that's hard to define technologically. And so, uh, uh, one of the, and so one of the old ways, like back to that old radio, the way you characterized it was harmonic distortion, signal-to-noise ratio, um, pretty much that, frequency response. In the digital domain, uh, those things really don't count anymore. We're dealing with time domain, we're dealing with things that are not characterized by, by essentially vacuum tube measurements. In the digital world, we're dealing with, uh, with, with pieces of information that can be left out or added, they can be transient, they can be uh, uh, skewed in various ways in time. Uh, so a much more complicated thing than THD plus N, which is a bad one anyway because uh, you spend all your time counting all those zeros in front of the percent sign. That's not a, better just say 120 dB and be done with it. It's far more compact and meaningful. So, so anyway, there's our little hair cell. There's our brain, I'm, I'm got ahead of myself, but basically the input from the hair cells goes to the brain, we figure it out, we send the feedback to the, to the cells back again. Uh, the key with that and why this brain picture is up there is because these events don't happen instantaneously. The, the first one does. The first one, the feedback initiation happens right away. Boom. Play a bad recording and the ears will shut down. Now go to a good recording and you have to wait for the feedback to start recovering and process. And that means you can't A, B something by flipping a switch. That isn't going to happen. You've got to wait. And it means that if I play a really crummy recording, a head drill, you know, just really awful thing, then you have to wait a long time for the ears to settle down and, and be back to a perceptual uh, mode again. At that point, then you can go into sonic nirvana, which is the visual acoustic. So with that, there's computer sound, OK? Uh, you will notice a little dot on the uh, dog's right ear. That's an ear trumpet. It's blue. Uh, uh, the guy's got it reversed, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, the main thing here is that uh, a lot of the 44.1 and low sampling rate standards would be kind of associated with this kind of thing. And then, and then from that, less. In other words, the CD was the gold standard, and you went downhill from there. And. Uh, uh, if, if, uh, if one looks at this a little more in detail, like, like what is going on? What kind of, of, of signals do we actually see? Now we're going to switch suddenly and go technical. I'm going to show some plots and things. And you don't have to worry very much about whether you understand all the details in the plot. Just look at the 
what sort of changes in them. It's the overall picture that counts, not the detail. So this guy we're familiar with, that's the impulse response when you have a brick wall filter, in this case a symmetrical one. And all the little ringy guys in front of the main event are what are called pre-echoes. And that, that kind of thing never happens in nature. You don't get part of the sound before you get it. It's gonna, ha it's gonna happen afterwards. So, so this is called uh, uh, dispersion, time, time domain dispersion. And basically, sort of clouds and, and clutters up everything, and you hear a little less of the detail, of what's going on. High resolution says, yes, detail, I can hear things inside. This says, no, you're not going to. Uh, another way, if you, if you had other things wrong, you'd have the dull, brittle sound of old digital, or sometimes called crisp digital sound. So anyway, this guy is, is not a good deal. Um, here's what happens. Uh, if I take a frequency sweep, like a chirp from a bird or something, and I run a frequency sweep backwards, uh, because of the time domain problem, some of the high frequency components will fold back into the mid-band of the response. And so you get ripples. Those little wiggly things on the left-hand side are ripples in the frequency response. So all bets are off when somebody says the frequency response of that CD filter is .00 dB flat. No way. Uh, once you add the time domain to it, you have something like this, and that's not a particularly nice picture. Worse than that, if you'll notice, the little peaky guys are at a higher amplitude than the average signal. So if I happen to elect and make my broadcast sound recording, and I've got a limiter in there that's all the way up, I'm down to the last Nat's eyebrow of a dB from clipping, and I send this thing through, uh, there is no headroom for, for that kind of stuff to go on. And the overload is going to happen within the DSP, so you don't know that you've gotten into trouble. The, the uh, display's not going to tell you. So here's what happens. It gets scrunched. And then you'll notice in looking at this scrunching that the disaster isn't happening just where the peaks are. It has continued all the way through the entire sweep. And that's because uh, in the case of the CD, you might have a 100-point filter, and this overloads and wrong, wrong numbers and so forth is propagated down the entire length of the filter. And so it continues to go, and we've memorialized a bad thing, basically. So that, again, is not high resolution. Uh, here's another example. This is a uh, tone cluster, and it's happens to be uh, eight, eight frequencies put together. They're all equal amplitude. They're separated apart. And they're chosen in phase and frequency so that we get that waveform, which has lots of sharp peaks and not much in the middle. And that same system is, oh, I'm sorry, not that system. This in case, it's, a, it's, a, it's an up converter. Uh, the DSP overloaded, and we get something like that. It, it, it couldn't take the headroom. The calculations went wrong somewhere. In this case, uh, this is what happened. And again, we find the more memorialization of the error. So, so nice not to have all this stuff. Here is a, here's where the CD is very good. This is a, this is a spectral uh, plot of that same waveform you just saw, uh, but a good one. And this is what a CD can do. And you'll notice it's down 130 dB or something like that. Well, it's a whole lot better than 90, according to the math. And the reason that happens is because this is an FFT, and we're averaging and looking at a whole bunch of events and filling in the cracks, and we can go down that deep you know, into it. The little rising part on the right-hand side is noise shaping. That's what it looks like. And uh, without that noise shaping, the information would fall through the cracks uh, and we'd have the, uh, the early uh, uh, grainy, grisly sound that, that uh, digital had. So the, the, was the, the various people that worked on figuring out the optimum noise shaping were brilliant on this. Uh, if we go through a good A to D and D to A recorder, real professionally, really good one, you get something that, that might look like this. It's possible to achieve this, uh, this uh, uh, 
kind of thing. Um, more likely, it's going to be about like that. This is still quite good. Uh, basically, 100 and, I think it's 105, 103 dB down in second and third harmonic, which are not really that important when, once they're down that low. And all the little spiky stuff is, is around 120 dB or lower. And this is the entire A to D, D to A process. So this is a whole lot better than, say, that. This is a, a it was a, just a basic commercial CD player doing the same thing. This is what you come, this is what comes out of it. So uh, there's a big difference between what us guys that are doing professional work and what happens in the, in the chipset world. Um, and you notice also on the right hand side where we had delineated um, tone cluster, now the whole thing is all smeared together and you can't tell what's up at all. And this is fairly typical of, 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 uh, of problems caused by jitter and we'll come into that in a minute. Here's what happens. Uh, uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Uh, workstations are interesting in that you can have absolutely synchronous files. It's possible to process one file in, in a different way than the other one, and then copy the whole thing with the processes different again to subtract out whatever you did, and then you take those two files and subtract them from one another. And if all of this is perfect, you should get nothing because, uh, because you haven't done anything. Well, it turns out uh, most work <coughs> processors end up doing something like this. Uh, the, the DSP isn't large enough to, uh, to handle everything that's going on. And we have, we have essentially a rash of noise and, and funny things that, that we can't explain. Here's another example, uh, more likely what happened in this case, this one can be explained, it's a buffer that, and a, and a call to a hard drive that, that caused these. Uh, so, so again, I mean, digits, uh, uh, file handling within a computer is not necessarily perfect. There's a ways to go. And, <clears throat> and uh, so we, we do that. Uh, clearly these things are, are hard to interpret. Like, like, what does that sound like? What do the other ones sound like? And, and it turns out uh, uh, when one more or less just puts up one's hands and, and say, yeah, I think I can hear something. And it's really easy to be fooled, say, well, that looks pretty bad to me. I don't think I want to listen to that again. Uh, so there's a prejudicial factor here. So it's one of the areas I'm trying to work on with the AES to get something defining this kind of problem where, where it can be specified a little better. Everybody will benefit. The THD plus N is not a good deal to start with, and I'll show in a minute that even the jitter specification is not a good thing either. There's things that go wrong with that. Uh, this one, just as a, as a lark, I put it in. That happens to be a good piece of wire. It's done with a sample sample and hold circuit, I pulse the wire and then and that close the sample on a quick and then look what comes down. This happens to be a hundred feet of, of reasonably good wire. That guy is a Radio Shack wire. I found the cheapest, horrible, most horrible thing I could find. And it's got dielectric absorption and some other things running around. So this the business about interconnect wire, some people say, well, it doesn't make a difference, but uh, 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 one can just essentially a sample and hold, like used in conversion, will will show this kind of stuff. The same test jig is actually used for looking for uh, thermal tails in amplifiers. And this is where uh, an event happens in an amplifier, a device changes temperature very slightly because the event did happen, and now the bias points aren't quite the same, and it tails off. So you have something that often you, you, the event is not audible. It's some little tiny transient or something like that, but the thermal tail is slow and you do hear it. So uh, that's why this test, and we got, it's, it happens to be very sensitive. Now, uh, I was talking about can we hear any of this stuff? And there are a few things we can. And this is, this is a little console. I built it back when I was probably uh, a few years out of college, so this thing's old and we still use it. Most of the recordings, anybody that's heard my, my work, 
most of them have come from this little console. It has, it has only two amplifiers in it. They're, they're in the output of it. The rest of it's all passive. The signals come in at high levels and it's passive mix and then goes to two amplifiers. And there's a little magic switch. You can't quite see it in this view, but if I go there, there it is. And it's called analog and digital. And uh, uh, that's a special magic switch. It's uh, the, the, the tapping point for the switch has a floating ground so it doesn't, the grounding doesn't get mixed up with other things. Um, the whole, in fact, the whole monitoring chain is floating relative to the recording chain. And this is the dividing line where it happens. And the analog digital deal there is basically uh, set up the mics, listen to it analog, and I might check the digital, it shouldn't be as good. And you'll notice the switch hasn't been used very much uh, because it doesn't need to be. It's, pre it's pretty much the same. With, with a lot of careful listening, yes, you hear a slight contraction of space, very slight contraction of depth, otherwise nothing, it's the same. Um, at least the same as far as, as I know now until somebody comes along and says, did you hear that? You've got this little thing going on. And at that point, then the whole, the whole ball game is over. It's like radio sound effects. You hear, the, you hear the thunder. And those that have been to old radio know that's a cookie sheet being shaken. Uh, those that don't know, it's thunder. So we have the same perception problem. The little switch is, uh, is good until, until the uh, next perception increment happens. Oh. Now we can get to jitter. And this is the top little dia scratchy up at the top is, is a typical sigma delta converter. This is a single bit, rather crummy thing. The, the good ones will have multiple bit, they're multiple bit hybrids, much more complicated than this. But this, this is the basic principle. The, you have part of the circuit is operating in the analog domain and part of it is operating the digital domain. And that's an important concept. This is not pure digital. Very, very important. And, and where the analog part occurs is after that uh, low pass filter, the bottom bl um, block, where we now go to continuous time. And that signal goes into a comparator, which says, ah, oh, that signal is either larger than or less than some reference. And if it's larger than, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pulse, I'm gonna feed a piece of data into a register and then if, if I have a clock going into that register, I can quantize the information. And now I'm in the, uh, I'm in the uh, uh, digital domain, and uh, I can take that quantized information and decode it, and I've got a, essentially uh, something I can play back. And this thing looks perfect because uh, you've got a, a summation network, and whatever comes around is summated against what goes in, therefore that should be perfect, and we have an almost identical filter coming out, therefore it should be good. It doesn't work because um, that little comparator has got all kinds of problems. It, it can hang up, it's got, time disper it's got time delays between inputs and outputs. Uh, there are many things that go wrong, so you end up with idle patterns and uh, no, and it goes on and on and on. So anyway, the, the important thing here is what happens down at the very, very bottom. There's a, there's a series of little pulses that, that you can see kind of a red and blue outline on them. That's, that is a, a jitter in the drawing, just a small amount of jitter. And the jitter going in the blue direction just simply changes the timing slightly. The jitter going in the red direction happens to misclock an input signal. Uh, if we get a misclock, we get a, a the, uh, the output, which is this little serrated looking thing, goes, keeps right on going. There's nothing stopping it because the last event said just go. So it goes until it gets the next clock, which finally says now you can come back down. But it's not going to come back down to where it started. It's going to integrate and come down slowly. And here again, we have the same memorialization of error that we were seeing before. The, we do something bad and then we, get, we pay the consequences of it for a long time. The blue guy is just simply a small amount of jitter. Um, uh, the system hasn't misbehaved, but we still have a long time for the, the problem to go away. So uh, if nothing else, uh, one of the things to remember in this whole thing is that uh, conversion is very analog. 
at least in a sigma deltas. The other kind of converter, which are called ladder DACs and ladder conversions, are very different. They, you basically have a bunch of switches and resistors, and you're, and you're firing these things to make uh, the equivalent code. And what happens there is a jitter is just simply a time displacement, and that type of converter is far more robust uh, than this would be. This thing is a very, very tiny amount of jitter. It's going to be audible. So what is jitter? That's what it looks like. This, this would be a classic jitter. It's seen on a, uh, uh, on a uh, microchannel plate scope. This is the darling of the, of the nuclear physics people. These things are still around, still used, even though they're old. Basically, it's an oscilloscope that has a very high gain light amplifier on, on the CRT. So you can look at tiny events. The circuits are usually very fast and they're accurate because the whole purpose is timing nuclear events. And so in this case, the scale of this is about, uh, I think the width of that line is probably something like about 50 to 100 picoseconds, which is the resolution limit of the scope actually. Um, and that would, be, that would be not too bad. We see that most of the time it's in the middle and then we have a gradual shading to the edge and that's a Gaussian roll off and that's what we like. Here is what happens though in real life. And this is, this is an example that I call the green dye example. Remember, maybe those remember way back, you painted green dye on a CD and it sounded better. Well, it turns out this is what's happening. It is real, not, not, not fake. He said it goes the wrong way. Uh, the top one is the, is the before you do anything to it. And, and most of the jitter there is, happens to be crosstalk between the servo motors and tracking servos and that kind of thing, getting back into the DAC. Gets around through the power supply, gets around through regulators, through the grounding, lots of ways it gets in. And the 18 nanoseconds is a fairly small number. Now, we go and coat this thing with, with dye. We have, the dye has a solvent and the now we've either changed some charges on the disk or we've warped it slightly. So now when the, uh, when the thing plays back, the servo activity is even more and we get more jitter. So in this case, uh, yes, it sounds different, but in the wrong way. So this is an example of, of I mean, one's not out of their minds when you say, well, you paint this thing and it sounds different, because it, it can. And this tells us something else, is that the interaction of parts within a system. It's, one has to be very careful with this. And this is not just simply hooking something up and the way it goes. This is more likely the culprit in digital. And what makes this a guy very bad is you'll notice most of the time it's residing over on the right-hand side of that trace. We're going along in good behavior and every once in a while, kabang, the thing goes shooting over to the left. In this case, quite a bit. Now, if you measure it in terms of RMS uh, jitter, as the way specification sheets would normally do, you'd say well, it's not very much there at all because most of the time it's not doing anything. However, on a uh, DSP system, we have an, a, a, a configuration on a DSP. It's called upclocking. It's necessary because if you put a, say, a 44 or 1 kilohertz signal into a DSP and you want to run the thing, run the processes at, uh, say, a couple hundred megahertz, then you use a PLL to upclock. And so the, the little divisions, the little time divisions of what you're working on and processing are very tiny compared to the signal coming in. So when you have something like this going on, where, where the, the PLL and the DSP is told this is all good, it's copacetic, it's right where the line is heavy, and every once in a while you throw it a ringer, then the, we have that phenomenon where, just like in the case of the sigma delta converter, where things go, go haywire, but in this case, the DSP loses some of the, uh, some of the, of the slots in its uh, process. So again, the same thing happens. If you lose some of the slots in the process, you've, you've memorialized an error, and it propagates through just like the other waveforms. And this is how it might look as a, as a chipset system. This happens to be a computer one. It could also be a, a CD player. It's not that much different. The very bottom says, okay, all you do is you run a clock into a server and then 
hook it up with an interface and go off to the DAC and you're done with it. Unfortunately, not quite that simple. Um, the top thing is more like it. And that little guy that's on the, it was said between the DSP and the DAC, which has PLL mark with an arrow going up, is a device that can get into trouble. And so uh, uh, something like this where the crystal starts on the left-hand side, it very likely is going to propagate jitter. And each time you go through one of these parts of the chipset, uh, the jitter actually starts getting larger. And by the time we get to where it really counts, we're in trouble. So uh, why does this occur? Because the manufacturers uh, can make a system like this, and it's very robust. It's not going to lose sync. It's going to work every time you turn it on. Life is easy, and it's also easy to use it. They spend lots of time in the marketing and engineering to make this thing to be sure it's easy to use. So uh, this is more like what one might find in a serious high-end player. Uh, and I'm not gonna, I could spend half an hour explaining all this stuff in there. But the basic thing is just uh, there's a lot of complexity that suddenly popped up. And, it's, and this complexity is dealing with, with problems, with problems that the chipset can't handle. And, and once the problems are, are fixed, then whatever is in the chipset is going to work fine. So, so we have uh, this case, uh, uh, the one part that's kind of interesting is this little thing down in right there. Uh, almost, almost always there's some place in the system that one has to isolate grounds between one part and another. And then there's, there's very nice uh, digital circuits that can do that. So whenever there's a product, that's the first thing I look for. Are, does a manufacturer uh, take time to, to, to resolve the grounding problems? The other thing you'll notice on here are some little uh, shunt regulator guys. There's current sources and shunt regulators. And that's so that the ripples and loading in a system don't propagate from one part to another. So in a current source, voltage jumps all over the place. It's like a, and, and this thing tied to the ground wherever it's supposed to be is exactly like a battery, except even better because the parts are very, very small and will pick up noise. So anyway, this is sort of the anatomy of, of a good high-end player. You're going to find things like that. Um, otherwise, it's a, a chipset under glass. You, know, you can put vacuum tubes. You can put all kinds of fancy things on a standard chipset, and it's not going to deal with the limitations. To an op amp, simple thing here. That, this, this is what an op amp looks like when you hook it up. You've got feedback resistors and something going in, and you get something out. And that, how can anything be much different than that? With the one exception that manufacturers like to make these things where anybody can use them. And in the days of, of diminishing returns, the power supplies have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller, and so the rail voltages have gotten small. And uh, there are many compromises inside to deal with what's called rail-to-rail -rail outputs, which uh, are going to, are, are at that point, the thermal tail corrections, other, other things, uh, whatever's going on inside Casco isolations are likely to be gone because this marketing thing is going to be more important. Uh, the, the worst one is, is, is that there's internal compensation capacitors in nonlinear circuits, and that technically means that if you've done something where the amplifier has to correct itself, that there'll be a charge on that capacitor and you have to wait for it to go away. We're back to the same time problem again. Do something which causes it to wiggle a little bit, and then we've got to wait for the capacitor to discharge. And so you'll hear that. Uh, a better configuration would be an op amp that is not unity gain stable. It's going to, you have to really work hard to compensate it now. And so it might take all these extra parts. And again, one can look at a circuit, one can look at a product, look at things and say, okay, which part did they use? Did they have to, did they have to compensate for it or did they take the easiest way out? So uh, it's just an example of that. Here is the what one usually finds, that little tiny dot between the big circuit on the left and the, and the volume control thing on the right is a surface mount uh, op amp. It happens to be a pretty good one, uh, but it's not likely to be as robust 
uh, for certainly for a tough cable situation as the through hole part is directly above it. And that part's not going to be as good as a dedicated line driver that can really put out and belt out something for a piece of wire. So uh, that in the background is a, about 100 feet of, of interconnect wire I would use in one of my sessions. It's a medical cable. It's a multiply shielded uh, thing. Not, not as good as a good high-end cable, but I can, I can adjust my electronics to match it, so I come out reasonably good. Uh, but in any case, uh, the si the, how the signals are interfaced plays a role. And all this is leading up to basically it's good to know what's inside. Uh, the specifications tell you one thing. It's nice to know a little bit about what's inside. And this is like the old days, good old days in hi-fi. People used to talk about triodes, interleave windings and transformers, uh, various types of biasing techniques, sometimes fixed bias, sometimes cathode follower, drivers. And, and it was a time when the world was conversant in all these things. I mean, uh, the people buying an amplifier would know pretty much that they, they were, we were getting involved with that kind of technology. And you had, like for example, the ultralinear amplifier that is actually named ultralinear. It's a certain circuit configuration inside. And so here we have the same thing in a way. In computer sound, this is very experimental. Computer sound is experimental. You have to, you have to play with it. You have to, you have to mess around with it. It isn't going to just pop out at you and just be magic. In the future, it's going to be magic because uh, it's downloadable. It can be remote controlled from an iPad or things like that. It can have the same uh, uh, convenience profile as an iPod. And that's where the industry is going. So uh, even the big industry, the artists have learned about high resolution. Anybody working on the files for creating a recording are going to be using higher speeds than they were. And the artists hear these things and they say, I want that. I don't like the other one. And so this is starting to widen the gap. You have one side, of, remember the computer speakers, you have one side of five volt rails, compromise, all these things. And, it's, and that's, that's, the, that's the gold standard. And you have uh, uh, MP3s or uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, perceptual compression. It's really the technical word for it. And that's way down on the food chain. And so that gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually something's going to snap. The, the main industry, the big industry, is sort of floundering. After all, there's about 300,000 tracks out there this year, new ones. Most of them are recorded in a bedroom or who knows what. Uh, some of them are pretty good. Most of them uh, are going to be maybe good, which means that you listen to it once and then you, know, you turn off the screen and go for something else. Uh, if it's done in close instrument, then it's spoon feed, definitely a one time. So, it's, um, so we have something like that. Uh, now, when, uh, back earlier I said, I was talking about uh, perception of, of the various distortions and things. So these three waveforms don't sound the same, not even close. You can tell them apart right away. Put them on a spectrum analyzer and they are the same. They will make the same plot. So what happens on the FFT, uh, the normal spectrum analyzer, the reason that it can't resolve what we hear is because the, the analyzer has to take a long time to make a, a whole series of multiplies. It's a matrix of multiplies and adds to get the results that we see. By the time it's gone through all that number crunching, the waveform has long since changed because we're not putting continuous sine waves in. We're putting in something that jumps all over the place. So, so the, the traditional way of defining and characterizing uh, just, uh, performance doesn't work. And so this is an example of a kind of thing where you can hear a difference and can't measure it. And all it is is this is a low frequency waveform with some hashy noise that's added to it and it just depends on which part of the peaks the noise is added and, and how much of a duration it is. Otherwise you it wouldn't, wouldn't know. 
This one is even more interesting. Uh, this is another uh, variation of the tone cluster you saw earlier. They, uh, clearly, these look different. They're not, they don't have the same at all. Uh, they don't sound the same. Uh, but this time, it's very subtle. Uh, they, they, uh, the, it takes a little while to learn what it is, and once you learn it, you can spot it every single time, which waveform is which. Uh, again, the analyzer doesn't know. It's going to show exactly the same, uh, same relationship of, of, eight, of eight tones. So uh, this one disproves the, the very basic concept of perceptual coding. Perceptual coding says, like ears, all those little hair cells are a bank of filters. And you've got, a, you know, there's got 15,000 of these little guys, and they're tuned. They're tuned in groups, actually, so they have a, some breadth. But basically, they're, it's a bank of filters. And you're going to play back music by coding it to a bunch of frequencies. It happened to be the same frequencies as was in the music. Uh, so in a way, you're reproducing the music via a box of whistles. The whistles are tuned to the, to the, to whatever you know, whatever spectrum the music had. And so, if you do it reasonably fast, you get what we hear. And the problem is, is that if you do it fast enough to go to the, what happens between these two waveforms, you have not done very much compression, so why bother? And the other reason for not bothering with it is because uh, these days information has gotten fairly cheap. It's a whole lot faster to go from one place to another with it, and therefore, uh, like old things, there's a limit as to, well, you don't really need to do this. You can, you can get a, you know, a half gig memory in a little tiny thing, and it's going to store as many files as you ever want, and now the files can be reasonably big and not have the problem. So uh, because of this widening gap between the things that were just awful and, and the, the high-end computer sound, which is as good as it's going to get, I mean, that's the same file that I'm using. Uh, then at some point, the, the nut's going to crack, and it's going to jump off in the direction of, of a better recording. I'm hoping that's going to happen, and I suspect the major industry, which is having troubles, will kind of work and gravitate in that direction also. Here's one more example. Uh, this one thing I haven't talked about is, is about cables and interactions and cables and setting up systems and so forth. And here is a simple thing, just a, an amplifier and a speaker. You know, there it is again. You just put an input to the amplifier, hook the speaker up to it. That should be done. It should work fine. Uh, and the problem, though, is that this is what you really have in a way. It's, even then, this is not complete. You've got an amplifier with a feedback loop. You've got an interconnect cable. You have a power supply. You have something going in, and if there's a player or something, you have that feeding it all. So it's a little more complicated than just the, the simple little op amp. There's also an interconnect cable in between. There's, there's two different grounds, and we don't know quite whether those two grounds are even the same or not. And we're not done yet. This is what happens uh, when, when you start looking at it from an equivalent circuit. and um, and what's going on here is you have a loudspeaker crossover network that's got stored energy parts. So they're throwing energy back into the, into the speaker parts or into the power amplifier. The, the power amplifier is not, if it's, a, say, a 3 or 4 or 500 watt amplifier, it's not going to be sitting drawing 500 watts. A few do, but most don't. It's going to be less than that. So it's going to be some kind of switch over from one side of ground to the other side at some point. And the power supply, is, which is up above, is going to re react to that. And we've got a power transformer. And if, the, if that power transformer is one of these neat toroids, it, they look beautiful, they're really tight coupled, uh, they're going to give more power from the line because you can, they're not going to droop as much. The diodes are going to conduct instantly when the right time happens. Uh, and the activity of the output devices is now <laughs> propagated through the power transformer into the power line. So, so then we, we go back on the other side to the player, and the player has an a inexpensive transformer. So it's got capacitance between primary and secondary, and 
and off we go through the regulators to the ground that's implied and then through the conversion and back out again. So now we have a big loop. We have a big loop of activity happening at the, at the output devices propagating from capacitance through the power transformer going back around creating jitter uh, in the servo and in the, in the path of conversion and coming out. And so uh, what, what happens here is I can make, in fact, I use for my recording sessions, I have a whole bunch of little uh, transducer things. They're interconnect cables that have sensors on them. They're battery powered amplifier sensors. And so I can hook up an audio cable and I can watch these currents and say, okay, that's just too high. It's coming from that. I can see it. I can see the activity going on. A computer is the worst of all of these. Be simply because computers haven't been designed for high-end audio yet. And we're still on the same thing. A mainframe is a mainframe, and the manufacturer is trying very, very hard to keep RF noise out of the world. And so it will tie everything to a solid ground. In the meantime, the, the CPU inside is, is, in some cases, drawing anywhere from 10 to 20, 30 amps of peak current. And so the magnetic fields associated with this, which then couple back around. Same deal with the supply. In this case, it's a switching supply, so it's even more efficient in sending this stuff around. Because if it's 99% efficient and you've got big surges, then a significant amount of those big surges are going to be on the power line. The power, and it's only the robustness of the power line that, uh, per, that, that controls it. So these things get complicated, and this is what we see. The, the top is a sine wave we're reproducing. The bottom happens to be a signal across a, uh, across a uh, input inter, uh, interconnect. And so you wonder, okay, if I change the cable and I have one that's got more copper in it, for this waveform, uh, it might sound better. If I had a cable that had more inductance in it, more, more of a low-pass filter type cable, then the little high-frequency ringy things would be attenuated. And maybe a DAC might work better if that happens to be interconnect uh, from a DAC. So at that point, uh, again, this is not mythology. This is real. It's uh, these things propagate around. And it tells us what we want to know, basically very simple, is that we have to take a great deal of care in hooking all these things up. And if we do, the rewards are very great. So this is the, this is the important thing. Uh, I'm almost wrapping up what I'm saying. This is it, basically. Uh, when, when, when connecting a system, absolutely 100% keep the power wires, 110 power things, isolated from everything else. They don't want to mingle with signal cables nor digital cables. Digital cables, they don't want to mingle with anything else either. And of course, audio cables don't want to. Uh, inputs of power amplifiers versus outputs never run the cables in parallel because the magnetic fields from uh, driving the speaker are going to get back to the input and change something. Uh, the chances are very, very good that one should have isolation transformers in different parts of the system. I found that in recording session equipment. The computer always has an isolation transformer with a good RF filter on it, uh, just to keep it out of the loop. Uh, uh, power amplifiers, uh, you saw what can happen. Uh, a very interesting one, in fact, if, if you're playing an LP and, you, and if you crank up the LP really loud and you're, you know, you're listening to it, you say, okay, that's pretty neat. Now, if I take that same setup and turn the power amplifier off, disconnect it, and just sit and make a file, make a high resolution file of playing the LP, it's now done in silence, and then play back the LP through a converter, uh, the chances are pretty good that the converted sound file is going to is going to work better than the the one that was made directly when the when the LP was playing. And this, again, is for this same phenomenon. The, the bigger the amplifier, the more likely it wants to talk back to the system. Or conversely, the harder you have to work to keep these big guys from coming back to the small guys. And the digital converter, the, the little 
Sigma Delta converter is every bit as delicate as a tiniest cartridge. It's got the same deal. It has to be isolated carefully. If it is, it's good, they'll work good. So anyway, uh, so all those things are isolated. Uh, anything that's extremely noisy, uh, isolation transformer is good. I'm not sure an isolation transformer is a good idea for a power amplifier because that's going to degrade its performance quite a bit. But sometimes it, it might be uh, perfectly good. Uh, one of the reasons vacuum tube amplifiers can work better than a solid state one is because of that phenomenon. The vacuum tube amplifier is likely to have, in uh, some cases, rectifier tubes that are very soft switches. They're not as likely to send big transients back up into the rest of the chain. And so sometimes uh, the, the sweetness and fullness of that type of design is because, it, because the rest of the system is working better. And finally, the whole thing says, you know, if we've done our job, let's see if I have it right here. I've gone way ahead of myself. Uh, then, yeah, help. Indeed I have. Uh, Okay, yes, sorry about that. Okay, last thing is that if a system, if the components are robust, in other words, if I could make a DAC that just didn't care about jitter going in, and a power amplifier that didn't have a ground on the input, in other words, it's totally floating, so you can't get a loop or funny stuff, uh, and a computer that that whatever is happening back at its power source and interconnects doesn't propagate through a sound card or something. If I could do those things, then it's highly probable that I could take anything, I could do anything to it, it's going to be robust and the sound quality is not going to change. The more the sound quality changes, then one of two things is happening. Either the system is extremely good and the program is extremely good, and you're really, and these things are really doing something to you. I'm, I'm hearing this little subtle thing. I didn't know it was there. If I change that cable, man, it's a lot better. Uh, or it's the other way around. Uh, if if the thing changes very very drastically, it's because there's some component in there that's uh, not robust. It's not doing its job. And the biggest problem then is that, yes, you can make a, find a cable that has less jitter propagating, but that's not solving the problem. Better to go right at what, what's causing the problem rather than looking for a piece of wire to do it. So, so this is, a, I'm hoping I can, I just conveyed some knowledge, you know, basic sort of, it's not cutting edge knowledge at all, it's just basic practical things that are good to do. Uh, and these make, you know, great sound.